So on the way back from Barnes and Noble and my uh, sale picks for the day, I just wanted to go and I stopped here at a little cafe I've never been to before, you know, only outside service safely, mask off on the patio only. Uh, but I wanted to go ahead and take a second to talk about an experience that I had last week that was really cool for someone like me. Like, hmm. My favorite film in the entire world is uh, George Miller's Mad Max Fury Road. You know, uh, he's my favorite filmmaker from everything he's done, with the exception of Witches of Eastwick, is just an example of unparalleled, for me anyway, of pure cinematic crap. Uh, it's, you know, for me, I, you know, everybody has their favorite filmmaker, I guess, the one that kind of just, you know, speaks their language, I guess. He's mine, because I really dig his, uh, his approach to sociology, to, uh, to mythology, to action filmmaking, his, uh, his constant sense of movement, propulsion, kineticism, it's, you know, like Kurosawa in the 21st century, uh, which is ironic because he's a guy who didn't really uh, get into Kurosawa. His, his control of near silent uh, visual storytelling and, uh, you know, pure cinema, the Hitchcock buzz phrase, which is like one of my most important facets when it comes to filmmaking. A Fury Road is the best example of that, of course. I mean, why wouldn't it be? He worked on it for about 20 years, if not more. Now, I've spent a lot of time actually doing research on Fury Road and also Happy Feet, which was made at Kennedy Miller Studios at around the same time. And I can tell you that they're very similar visually and technically for a reason. And I can tell you, too, that they were both in production for a good long while before... Uh, before even the earliest dates for both of them were reported. Fury Road actually started production, I guess, around 1993? Not 95, which, you know, puts its gestation period overall, its development, its production, at around, well, I mean, it was, it was 18 from the given date of 1995 when they started production, uh, or, no, sorry, yeah, it, it was, it was a good 20 years, so it would be about 22 years gestation period for a film. And in that way, while the, uh, while the film itself, its basis and what it was and what it was meant to be, didn't change all that much outside of the, uh, the loss of uh, Mel Gibson for a good reason, uh, which required some rejiggering in terms of what the film was ultimately supposed to be for Max. Uh, in that 20-year period, uh, he was able to kind of pin down, strip away all of the kind of the noise that, you know, surrounds a project in its first couple of years. He turns it into something both mythic and dreamlike, lyrical, you know, common buzzwords, but here they really apply. I mean, there's nobody who's better at, like, lyrical action filmmaking than George Miller. Uh, his, his sense of editing, not just the... Uh, or I guess his, his wife's sense of editing, uh, and not just the center framing that everybody talks about, but just like the, uh, the, uh, the constant cutting on movement that's always, you know, not just cutting on movement, but within cutting on movement. Uh, also, I guess, match cutting on, uh, on composition, which is, fa which is fantastic. Um, mm. And in that film, uh, he also accomplishes better than anybody else that I've ever seen in this, you know, past the silent era, at, uh, at telling what is a relatively complex story with a lot of different uh, subtexts and undertones and different layers, all working underneath a very, very simple plot. There's a throw line there. You know, and when he talks about story, I really agree with what George Miller says about story with telling, which is that, you know, story, uh, which I guess some people don't agree with, but, you know, um, story is not plot. The two are very different. You know, story is uh, narrative. It's the relationship between the characters and the audience. It's the interplay between the filmmakers and the audience, and that's storytelling, the emotional exchange and the intellectual exchange. That's story in filmmaking. Uh, mm. And he's able to do that most particularly with the, with the relationship between all these characters in this film, because this is a film, of course, it's on the move. I mean, 
you've all seen it, and I'm saying things that I'm sure you've probably heard in some level or another before about it. Uh, but I had a chance to actually see it at one of our functioning drive-ins that we have here in the city, in Austin. And uh, there's no better atmosphere to see that film than in a drive-in. It being a Mad Max film, and you know, they own their origins, at least in America, to AIP. And uh, I mean, they were, they were drive-in movies, and they're meant to be drive-in movies. And seeing it out there uh, is so cool because the screen is dirty, it's flecked with dust and the grime and the grit of like a billion showings before, you know, that had come before. The screen is rippling because it's not secured down very well, so it gives it almost like this weird dreamlike uh, quality to the image, which is really cool. It really adds to what the film is. Um, hmm. And in those moments that you want to get out and you want to go smoke a cigarette, which of course, if you guys have started to notice by now, I do pretty often, you get to watch the film almost entirely silently with only the sound coming from the other cars. And of course, the sound of the cars themselves, which for a Mad Max film is, a, you know, pretty appropriate to help you along. And so it becomes that silent film. You know, it, it becomes totally silent filming, which harkens back to, you know, an idea that Miller expresses when he talks about filmmaking. He talks about the purest, uh, to, to paraphrase, he talks about the purest film experience that he's ever had was when he was a child. And he would, you know, he would sneak up to the, you know, to the movie houses as a kid, and he would have to watch the films, you know, like silently from beneath the floorboards, or films that weren't, you know, allowed to be watched by kids like The Thing and things like that, you know. Or when he was broke, and he was a college student, he had to go watch movies for free at the drive-in, you know, by being outside the gates, you know. And it goes back to how he edits his films as well, which is also why they're so smooth and they're so visual, because he edits them without sound. Uh, and Fury Road, interestingly enough, was actually, in its original conception, envisioned, not only to not have any uh, dialogue, but not to have any music either. It was only going to be the sounds of the cars and the engines and the, and the fury of the environment around them. That was going to be the only soundtrack to the film. Everything was going to be non-verbal communication. But they, they kind of loosened up after that, on that after a while, and so, but I mean, that element is still pretty strong in the film. I mean, you know, this being a film that's constantly on the move, characters who are constantly in survival mode, all of their emotional changes and their dynamics happen on the go and they happen in the moment. There's not really a lot of backstory, say for Max's flashbacks that occur once or twice and the few little lines that we get about Furiosa uh, in the moment. But mm, we see how they change as the film progresses and we see it mostly on their facial expressions and how they act toward each other and their body language. And, uh, you know, and even in terms of composition, the strength that a certain character will have in the frame uh, compared to one another. You know, it's, it's all just like fantastic stuff and it's implicit stuff too, not just the obvious stuff. It's the implicit stuff in that film uh, that make it for me like a textbook on filmmaking because that's what I want to do with films. And that's what I also think it's, you know, it's going to be a textbook for filmmakers going I hate this phrase because it sounds so clinical and uh, business-like, but going forward in action filmmaking, I think this is going to be a, a brand new textbook, much like The Road Warrior was. And I got to tell you, if you ever get a chance, go and see it at a drive-in. Best atmosphere for it, especially in COVID time. Bye.